Just a little more than 100 kilometers off the coast of West Africa and the Canary Islands are a new favored route for people smugglers trying to get migrants into Europe. And it's one of the deadliest crossings there is. This is Roundtable. Welcome to the program. I'm David Foster. The islands are Spanish, but mainland Spain has so far refused to take most of those who've arrived on the islands, leading one human rights group to call the Canaries an open air prison. Europe continues to face its largest migration crisis since World War II. Spain's Canary Islands off northwest Africa have become the latest migration hotspot. This Atlantic route is the deadliest into Europe. One person drowns for every 24 that make it across safely. Figures show that more than 16,000 migrants have arrived on the Canaries in 2020, half of these in the last month alone. The number of people arriving by boat has increased sixfold since 2019. Local and international aid groups say they are struggling to cope with the influx. The Spanish government is pledging more funds to help local authorities and working with African governments to deport migrants to their countries of origin. But until solutions are found, the Canary Islands are becoming a new focus of Europe's migrant crisis. OK, time to get talking. At this roundtable, we welcome Graham Keeley, a journalist in Madrid, mainland Spain, covering the migrant story on the Canary Islands. We go to Brussels next. Say hello to Lina Vosiliut, Research Fellow in the Justice and Home Affairs Unit at the Centre for European Policy Studies. And in London, we welcome back Tam Sang Zhu, Africa Analyst. Great to have you all on the programme. Graham, let me come to you, uh, first of all, since you're following this pretty much minute by minute. There's unrest at the biggest port on Grand Canaria. What's been happening there? Essentially, there are over 2,000 people camped out uh, on the edge of uh, the dock in a, in a res uh, town called Morgan. Uh, this is um, uh, basically because uh, there are no other places to put these people. These people have been there for weeks um, and um, local um, officials have said really there's only accommodation for 400 people. But as I say, at the moment there are over 2,000. Um, Yesterday, the, um, of the uh, immigration uh, authorities tried to move 200 of these people away, uh, and they didn't. But it appears they didn't have anywhere to put them, um, and uh, now they've had to backtrack and try and find somewhere. I should say that the Spanish government have been trying to um, uh, make uh, three different military um, camps available for the um, uh, migrants uh, to move into. Um, and that appears to be underway at the moment. Almost 17,000 in the course of this year, but I read that half of that number is in the last month alone. So why the sudden surge? Well, it's a, not a sudden, sudden surge as, as such. Um, this has been going on since uh, the start of the year and into um, some of last year. What, what's been happening essentially is that um, the route uh, from the north of Morocco over the Mediterranean uh, towards Spain um, was um, uh, blocked because um, of greater security on the north coast by the Moroccan government, who displaced many of these migrants to the south of the country. And from there, um, the uh, human uh, traffickers decided um, that the best route were, was to move um, the, their um, human cargo, these people, um, over to um, West Africa and on to the Canary Islands. Um, as we've seen in the past over the years, when one route is blocked uh, across uh, from uh, Africa towards um, Europe, then another one has to be used. Um, this happened when, uh, the, uh, when Libya descended into chaos uh, and uh, then the uh, traffickers opted to try and get people across from northern Morocco. And now these people... So, so let, across... if, you, if you don't mind me interrupting, I'm going to bring Tamsang in at this point. What I was trying to suggest was that in the last month alone, the number um, has increased rapidly. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But 
terms of the networks of these people smugglers, these traffickers, have changed because of what Graham said? Yes, uh, that, that is correct. Uh, the people that used to uh, follow these networks, remember these are networks that are formed by uh, people that are already in Europe, some of them that have traveled um, and have been able to reach their intended destinations. They tend to feed back information to their families, their friends, you know, the towns, the villages where they came from, and then link them to uh, these people who then facilitate um, the people that we uh, have always called uh, people smugglers. So these are networks. And of course, crossing through Libya has become difficult. The other Moroccan side has become difficult. Uh, you know, that journey across the Mediterranean has become so difficult. So that's where you see a lot of them coming off the coast around Senegal, um, then going to the Canaries. But then there's, there's, there's a bigger picture, I would say, uh, in that most of the people that live um, believe that they are living for greener pastures. And of course, I've just spoken to uh, colleagues and young people in Dakar and Senegal who say the country is in mourning uh, because of the loss of life in terms of what happens, but also the fact that these young people are going um, you know, across a dangerous journey, believing that uh, there are greener pastures beyond is it, is their it, own countries. Is it not so much that they are choosing, the migrants are choosing to go to the Canary Islands, but that the, the network of the people, traffickers, have decided this is the best way? It's not necessarily where the migrants themselves want to end up? And not necessarily, because uh, most of the migrants that are leaving are not in control of uh, where they are going to go and how they are going to get there. But sometimes, especially off uh, this particular route from uh, the, the coast of uh, countries like Senegal going to, to the Canary Islands, uh, you know, there are people who are able to organize that by themselves and just take a risk and try to, to reach that destination, difficult as it might be. So I, I would say in this case, it's both. It's both the networks and the people who say they will facilitate and others that just believe that, you know, we are seven, we are eight people, we will try to make that journey. Uh, but I, I think there's an old issue here in that a lot of people in Africa have always considered the Canary Islands as part of Africa, uh, which is a different uh, discussion all, all, all the same. But when they're trying to reach these islands, these are journeys that have been done so many times. People are familiar with the roads. Um, so it's so, it's not so much depending on the facilitators or the smugglers uh, as would have been happening through Libya uh, and the Mediterranean in the other months that have gone by. Uh, Lena, let me ask you about something that was said by um, a local MP. His name's Alberto Rodriguez Almeida. Uh, last Palmas MP, he said, we do not want the islands becoming the new Lampedusa. We should expel the illegal immigrants. Lampedusa, of course, being that small island of Italy, uh, which many had managed to reach after leaving Libya and other parts of North Africa. What, what, what does the European Union make of what is happening so far? Uh, European Union seemed uh, not to have found the solutions since 2015 crisis. There have been a lot of talk on how to improve equal and fair uh, responsibility and solidarity sharing across the EU member states uh, for the asylum seekers and migrants who enter, uh, including through um, sea arrivals that we see in the uh, uh, Canary Islands also. However, no recipe have been found. European Parliament have put several proposals uh, to to come up with the mandatory relocation quota. However, it was very fiercely objected by Poland, Hungary, Visegrad bloc countries who didn't want it to be part of, of, of uh, uh, this mechanism. And therefore, it, it was left for this new European Commission to find, um, to find the recipe once again. And it seems uh, commission this time opted with the kind of proposal of uh, 
flexible solidarity, meaning either countries could relocate asylum seekers or they could or uh, indeed they or indeed they could pay they could pay not to have them in their country as yeah. well. It, it's a very confusing picture. I want to go back to something that both Graham and Tamsang mentioned, which was the location of the Canary Islands. We're going to bring up a map here and show how close they actually are to the west coast of Africa, slightly more than 100 k's, I think, at the closest point. And then as we pull out, we will see where that is in relation to Morocco. Graham was talking about the routes out of Morocco being closed. And pretty close to that, uh, we see Ceuta and Melilla, uh, Spanish enclaves on the North African coast, which was a, a favoured place uh, for migrants to try and reach Europe. I think it was uh, 2019, there were 5,000 got in there. This year, it's been down to only 1,500, I believe. Graham, let me come back to you and ask you about a meeting that was held in the Canaries a couple of years ago, warning that this could well be a problem in the future. A Frontex meeting, that's the um, European group that looks after what's happening in Mediterranean waters, et cetera, et cetera. They knew this was going to come. They knew this was happening. Yes. Yes, they did. Um, I have spoken to aid agencies who have said to me uh, that meeting was, was very important because Frontex could see what was happening. They could see how the routes were being changed by the people smugglers. Um, and they warned that we must prepare for this. Uh, and yet, uh, certainly according to the aid agencies, um, nothing was done. And now we find ourselves in this situation. Um, just to come back to you on, on a point you mentioned earlier about why such a huge rise in numbers in the past month. Um, there's various factors. One, um, uh, the seas and uh, the winds uh, in that part of the, the Atlantic are more calm at this time of the year. So it makes actually crossing over easier. And secondly, um, um, again, according to the aid agencies I've spoken to, um, a considerable number of people making the crossing now are from Morocco and they're coming because of the economic impact of the COVID pa pandemic in their own country. And earlier in the year, um, the majority of migrants uh, reaching the Canary Islands were from Western African countries like Senegal, Mauritius, and, and other countries like that, further to the south. But now they say uh, that the, the, um, there are more economic migrants coming. Graham, um it's been described by various aid agencies as being rather like an open air prison. And I mentioned the quote from the, the Vox MP, rather right wing party, saying we don't want this to become a new Lampedusa. What is the general sentiment on the Canary Islands about uh, this massive arrival of new people who will be dependent upon the local economy and the Spanish economy for some time to come? Is, is there any resentment? There is resentment. Uh, I've spoken to people who are angry. Um, they say, look, we're in a bad enough situation uh, at the moment um, with the economic effects of uh, the COVID. Uh, the fact that this is a, uh, a set of islands which depends upon tourism. 35% of their GDP is linked to tourism. There are obviously no tourist, tourists coming. And yet the people who are coming are migrants and they're getting put up in, in uh, uh, tourist hotels and we're paying for it. So that amongst some people in the islands, that creates a certain sense of resentment. However, I think it's important to say that um, at the weekend there was a, a, a demonstration by islanders on Gran Canaria in favour of the migrants, saying these people are not getting treated well enough. Um, also, this week um, have been people taking food parcels to the people at the dock in uh, Morgan uh, to try and offer them some um, some some help. So it's a mixed so let's, picture. Let's go to Talina once again, and I'm going to bring up some words of Ilva Johansson, the EU Internal Affairs Commissioner. She went to Gran Canaria, I think, at the beginning of this month on November the 6th or somewhere like that. Well, she said anyway when she was there, there are a lot of people supporting migrants uh, here in the Canary Islands. Migration management is a responsibility of the EU as a whole. And so let me ask you, Lena, um, how seriously is Spain taking its responsibility in this situation? What is it doing? There has been uh, previously, if we come back in, in history, uh, Canaries have been a bit also in the media attention in 2006 when there was so-called Cayuco crisis. And afterwards, the Frontex had 
inserted this operation Hera and uh, it has been renewed a few times, but since afterwards the migration flows into this so-called West, West African route uh, have became so low, it was halted and now it, it kind of uh, um, resurged again. And maybe it's, it's very interesting to see that maybe it's actually effect of EU's policies in the other areas. For instance, EU trust funds being uh, channeled to Libya, uh, more cooperation with Libyan Coast Guard that made uh, Libya uh, crossing through Libya increasingly unattractive, increased cooperation with Morocco also. The EU doesn't give out visas to migrants. So there have been many calls for this to happen. I is there any chance that uh, they will change their ways with regard to that? I mean, uh, with the EU policies, I think we have some lessons that have not been learned. For for instance, uh, indeed, the uh, EU visa policy is maybe one of the reasons why migrants uh, and refugees or economic migrants who simply would like to work in the EU, uh, let's say as seasonal workers, uh, they cannot do it through regular channels because various bilateral agreements, for example, with Spain would be accessible for Moroccans, but let's say not to Senegalese or, or Malians. So this creates mm. uh, practically inability to come in legal and regular ways, creates these pressures and uh, uh, for people to try and find the ways to come other ways. And I, I would also and, and like... They, and they do, it, they do it this way, and unfortunately so many of them are losing their lives. Yeah. Tamsang, let me come to you. Um, this is a bigger picture question. Why, after so many stories of so many tragedies, do so many Africans still regard Europe as the promised land? Well, it, it is not so much that they regard uh, Europe as the promised land, uh, but it is because they believe that uh, that is where the immediate solution lies. Uh, you should realize that ever since Africa, or most of Africa, became independent uh, from European colonization in particular, um, those former European colonizers have maintained a political stranglehold on most of the African countries. In other words, the administrations that are running Africa in the most, uh, especially the Francophone Africa, have been, you know, political leaders that appear to have the blessings of Paris and, uh, you know, advancing the interests of European investors and European interest more than the interest of their own people. So most of the people, young people growing up, in those parts of Africa are still poor. Uh, the opportunities around them are very minimal, and they see the opportunities being where they believe their money is going, where they believe the mineral money is going. Yes. Almost everything, whether it's cocoa or minerals, they believe that these things are going to Europe, and they so they see where their opportunities uh, lie. But also, I think... And of course, some of the headlines is, are taken by success stories, uh, African footballers who've made it big in Europe as well. Graham was mentioning um, the economic impact of, of this in the Canaries, in, in other countries as well. And I have read that the traffickers have dropped their prices. Is that only going to encourage more people to make these kinds of journeys? It is it is too early to tell, uh, but but one thing that um, you know you get when you talk to these young people in particular that travel, some of them with babies on their backs, they 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 simply say this that they, they believe that the world is racist against Africans. So you you go to the Canary Islands, they tell you that they are Venezuelans that are going there, they are Cubans that they they are people that are coming from Latin America to the Canary Islands, but nothing is said about them being the migrants that are not wanted um, on, on Canary well, let's Islands. Let's go to so, Graham. Let's go to Graham. I mean, this, this idea of Venezuelans, other Latin Americans, I don't know whether that's true or not. What do you know? It, it is very true. There's a big Venezuelan um, population there. Uh, and I would say that uh, as for um, bad feeling towards Latin Americans, I'm afraid to say it does exist uh, amongst some people in Spain. Um, they, they do encounter some kind of racism, uh, unfortunately, uh, as well as uh, Africans going to um, the, the Canary Islands and uh, mainland Spain. 
uh, but it's from a minority, and uh, it's important to say. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you're, you're correct in saying that, um, that the, these people regard coming to the Canary Islands and, and mainland Spain as a place where they will um, encounter a new life and, uh, and be able to make uh, more of what they can um, that, than they may have done in, in Africa. Graham, will, will Spain change its tune? Will it take migrants? What is its plan? Well, it's complicated because um, they, uh, um, uh, uh, Carolina Darius, the territories minister, went there last week and said, we're going to do three things. We're going to provide more um, reception centers for the people who've already made it, but we're also going to deploy uh, three patrol boats, uh, a submarine, uh, a spotter plane, and we're going to extend our diplomatic links with uh, countries like Senegal and uh, Mauritius. Um, and uh, they're also going to deploy um, police in those countries, Spanish police, uh, to work with the authorities. So they want to deter more migrants coming. Um, I've spoken to the, the Spanish uh, government who say, look, we have uh, moved a thousand uh, migrants from the Canary Islands uh, uh, to mainland Spain. These were what we would call vulnerable people who would face uh, um, persecution or uh, other, other, other um, situations back at home. Uh, and so we're not... But, uh, but no move to... on, on the, the larger number, on the, the 16,000 plus, just, just that 1,000? Just 1,000, that's all they'll say at the moment. So it's a huge okay, number. Lena, let me... Lena, let me come to you. Graham mentions there that uh, patrol boats are going to be put into the area. Spanish police are going to be sent um, to some of these countries and that they're going to try and persuade Senegal and other places like that, Mali, etc., to keep these people um, in their own countries. Every time you squeeze a pressure point for migrants, be it Greece, Turkey, Libya, in this case, it happens to be the Canaries and part of the Atlantic a new pressure point is created elsewhere. Two questions, where might that be and how do you prevent that? Uh, thank you for this question because it's, uh, it's in fact what we are fearing that uh, there will be more pressure on those countries of transit and origin put once again and we saw it back in this uh, so-called um, in 2016 crisis where actually Mauritania was pressured in establishing a so-called migrant reception or refugee reception center and which was uh, basically afterwards closed down for very inhumane uh, conditions uh, also it didn't meet international requirements and so on and we we are witnessing such uh, moves towards offshoring all, all ac across the board, and it's something, um, yeah, the bilateral deals that yeah. Spain have had in the past and trying to secure once again with Senegal and Mauritania are, in fact, very interestingly producing maybe opposite effects. What uh, policymakers, okay. uh, because right, I'd so like you're not happy with what. No, no, we've got we've got uh, very little time left, and I want to bring Tang Sang back in at this point as we come towards the end of this this roundtable discussion. What is the future uh, for the traffickers? Well, is anybody well, clamping down on well, them hard enough well, well, and would, for the migrants? I would, I, would say, I would say that in general, the 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 solution lies in what Africa is going to do politically. The COVID nineteen pandemic has shown African leaders that they can't depend on what goes on outside, even their healthcare. They can't fly anywhere at the moment. They have to get treatment internally. So they have to begin to have uh, policies that are rejuvenating their own economies, their own eco um, communities. Just like what China has done, what just like what the Middle East has done in the main, the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. So Africa has to begin to look after itself. And, and then also, I think Europe and other countries, they should then realize that the they can only you know, limit the pressure on themselves mm. if they allow but let Africa me ask you this. to be a rich continent again. Let me ask you this. Those migrants who have made it to the Canary Islands, whatever the conditions they're living in, and notwithstanding the fact that so many of those who tried to make the journey didn't actually make it, but for those who do arrive, 
are they at least at the moment, even if they don't know what their future is, the, the lucky ones? No, not, not really. Um, most of the Africans that I've met, and I've been in the diaspora in, I mean, on, on and off for probably about 30 years now, uh, most of the people will tell you that they miss home, home is better. Whether they went by boards, whether it was illegal, or they flew first class, almost everyone will tell you that they believe the opportunities are back home. The environment where they think their children need to grow up is back home. So even those, uh, they still be going what they consider to be difficulties. But at some point, any one of them, when you talk to them on one-to-one, -one, they will tell you that they would rather go back home or they just want to work for five years in Spain and go okay. back home. So Africans don't want to live away from home, unlike what is believed. Yes, but they do, and they continue to do so, and they have the most terrible journeys, and they have the most uncertain futures at the moment. Maybe that will change uh, sometime in the um, the years to come. Listen, thank you very much indeed, Tamsan. Thank you, Lena Graham. Uh, great to read your reporting on what's happening in, in the Canaries. Keep up the good work. And thank you for being on the program. Wherever you happen to be watching this, our thanks to you uh, for sitting down, spending the time with us at our roundtable. We hope to have your company next time. But for now, from me, David Foster, goodbye. <laughs>